to plenary two for the biennial conference. The theme of the plenary is a comparative perspective to IPR and competition, lessons and experiences from across the globe. We would request all participants to please be seated so that we can stick to the timeline. As with the pre previous plenary, we have uh, chair four uh, discussants and two paper presenters. Uh, as chair, we have Mr. Eduardo Perez Mota, former president, Federal Competition Commission, Mexico. Uh, we have Derek Ritzman, senior vice president, Compass Lexicon, as discussant. Uh, Ayman Shafai, independent consultant. Kiran Mitarban, former executive director, Competition Commission of Mauritius also our discussions and uh, we will be joining by uh, Ms. Sujita Subramaniam, Senior Lecturer, University of Liverpool as the final discussant. Uh, Mr. Avinash Sharma, Panel Council, Competition Commission of India and Mr. Itimuleng Lisofe, Senior Legal Analyst, Competition Commission of South Africa would be presenting their papers. And with that, I would request Mr. Mota to please take you over the session. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we, we have, as, as the first panel, uh, in this second panel, uh, we have a first class a group of people who, who are going to be discussing and presenting uh, uh, our documents. Uh, the, the basic topic that we are going to touch on is a comparative perspective of uh, intellectual property and competition, uh, lessons and experiences from, from across the globe, some from different uh, regions. Uh, we will try to basically answer five questions. Uh, I would like to pose them uh, just in front of all of you, uh, and you have them in the program. The first question is how have uh, jurisdictions across the globe uh, try to tackle issues arising from the apparent conflict between intellectual property and competition, and especially how emerging markets have, have been trying to do that. That will be the first question. The second question is uh, procedural challenges uh, that institutions have in, or in order to face this conflict. Uh, question number three, which is also very important, is what, what, what are the lessons that we can learn from uh, international experience uh, ongoing practices and policies vis-a-vis -vis IPR and IPR and uh, and competition at a global at a global level. So we know that many uh, competition authorities have already issued the uh, guidelines. This is the case of I mean just to mention some. That this is the case of the European Union, the the, the US, uh, either the FTC, especially the DOJ has already uh, issued the guidelines the Singapore Competition Authority, the Canadian Competition Authority. We have some studies by the OECD. We have some documents by UNTAD. So this has been a, an issue that has been discussed at the different levels, multilateral, well, plurilateral, uh, and uh, at, at, the, at the domestic uh, 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 agencies, trying to coordinate these two regulators, IPR regulator and a competition regulator. Well, as some of, of our colleagues from the first panel said, this is not the only issue. If we deal with the pharmaceuticals, we have to deal with competition, we have to deal with the sanitary or, or a health a, a regulator, if we, have to, if we deal with telecoms, we have to deal also with the, with the telecoms regulator. So is this, this a problem of coordination at the domestic level? <coughs> is there? And if it, the, the last question has to do what, what could be done at the international level? So we can have a, an additional level of, of, uh, of, uh, of court, possible coordination, which is a global international level, IPR and competition. As you know, the, the much more work has been uh, done already at the multilateral level in terms of IPR, not that much in terms of uh, competition, but work has been done importantly in the, in the ICN, in the OECD, and UNTAD for, for, the competition, for the competition side. So I will stop here, and I will, we will have first uh, uh, two presentations. Uh, 
uh, that after those presentations, though for those presentations, we will have 20 minutes for each presenter, and then we will have our discussants, which, which are here with me, and they will have 10 minutes each. So let's start with the same, with the first, uh, the first presentation, which is going to uh, be done by uh, uh, Abhinavash Sharma, who is a uh, uh, who is a panel counsel of the Competition Commission of India. So you, you will have the floor for 20 minutes, and we will have our disciplinary lady that is there uh, with, the, with the red flag. So I would like to ask you all, please, to respect our disciplinary lady and respect that flag. So when th that flag comes, uh, comes in, we will have to, to stop. Thank you very much, and please uh, go ahead, uh, Sharma. Good morning. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Kurtz and CIRC for inviting me for this conference. Most of the things has been stated yesterday and since morning. I don't intend to repeat any of these things. My presentation is going to be uh, just five, six slides and then I'm just going to examine few of the key issues which Indian competition authorities and say other regulators and the courts are facing. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take one slide which is pure on the theoretical perspective and the next four slides I'm going to talk about the problem which is being faced in India to be precise. Most of us are aware, I don't think we require any reiteration what exactly is the so-called conflict between competition at the one side and IP on the another side. We all are aware, since time immemorial, we need to protect our property. And property means intellectual property as well. There cannot be any dispute that we need not protect intellectual property. The only issue which remains is to what extent we should reward invention, to what extent we should protect, in what extent we should promote the innovation. And when I say intellectual property, I mean all kind of intellectual property, be it copyright, patent, or the trademark, or GIs, or any XYZ. Intellectual property which we are talking about. There is a lot of academic literature which talks about the so-called conflict between IP and competition, and whether these are the complementary to each other, whether it's a quid pro quo, or whether one should be given primacy over the other. So we have a lot of academic literature. In my own assessment, I don't find there is any conflict. When we say we need robust IP regime, that doesn't mean we are trying to undermine, undermine the mandate of the competition authorities or vice versa. According to me, both the regime can go ahead simultaneously. We don't have to give a precedence over one over the another. Just, I will come straight to the Indian Competition Act and the only provision under the Indian Competition Act is section 3, clause 5 of the, which try to say, broadly speaking, we have uh, anti-competitive agreements as a section 3, then abuse of dominance as section 4, and then we have a merger control regime in 5 and 6, which talks about merger acquisition, amalgamation, all those kind of combinations. So the only provision which we find under the Competition Act, which try to focus on competition, sorry, IP, is 3, clause 5. And it simply says, it's a not, not a big provision, it simply says it's a try to recognize the protection which we have under different IP legislation in this country, 
because the competition is a new phenomena in this country. Competition is not something which is there since last 50 years or something. The first act which we had is 1969, the MRTP Act. And the subsequently in 2002, we have this Competition Act. And it also started enforcement only in 2009, as far as anti-competitive things and abuse of dominance provision was concerned. The merger control has been started in 2011. So actually, we don't have as such jurisprudence, which will try to make all these kind of uh, jurisprudence. So just have a look at this provision. And I would say it's a standard. It's a standard to the extent it says that nothing contained in this section shall restrict the right of any person who is having these rights. The only important thing which I find here is reasonable condition. So this could be a moot point, and I'm going to talk about the few cases to what extent competition authorities, or say Competition Commission of India, can intervene in IP-related issues. It says, I told you in the previous slide that you are getting protection of these acts, and then it simply says there are, you have a two exceptions. One is, a IP holder may have reasonable condition. So again, you can have a debate what do you mean by this reasonable condition that are necessary for the protection of such rights. So if you have a patent, you can go to the court for the protection of your patent. In case of there is an infringement, you can go and you can have a suit, you can get an injunction from the courts, which is indeed being granted in on case-to-case -case basis. Now the question is then to what exactly the competition authority is going to look into. Now, if you look at the term reasonable, and the second thing, one is a reasonable condition, who is going to look into that? Second is, in most of the abuse of dominance cases, what all kind of things which we are looking at, IP may be an exception to an agreements, horizontal agreement or to the vertical agreement, but the IP has not been made an exception as far as abuse of dominance is concerned. So if there is abuse of dominance, the, the competition authorities will be well within rights to examine those things and investigate and possibly impose penalty on that. So this is bringing us to here. If there is an abuse of dominance by an IP holder, or if possibly there is a say some kind of merger acquisition or amalgamation between two dominant entity, that would be subject matter of say investigation or subject matter of scrutiny by the Competition Commission of India. Few area of conflict, which is most of these issues are ongoing basically and we don't have a concrete jurisprudence, shall I say from Competition Commission or say from the High Court or say from the Supreme Court. Now, what would be these issues? We all are aware the moment we have a IP protection, say a patent holder, there is a some kind of exclusivity which has been granted to that person by virtue of an act. So then what exactly the Competition Commission is going to look into? The Competition Commission is going to look into from pure competition perspective that if you are a dominant, so let's take a hypothetical situation, or indeed we have uh, this real situation, if you have a patent holder, which is having a say 32,000 patents, and you are abusing their dominant position, if this is the allegation, mostly in the realm of SEPs, standard essential patents, so to what extent competition commission can look into that? We are aware of the ongoing Ericsson matter, which is going on in the court, and the basic allegation against the dominant player is, you are a, such a big, you are having a say 32,000 patents, and you are 
not committing or you are not complying with say frank terms fair reasonable and non discriminatory the standards which we have so the question is who is going to examine these issues if there is a abuse of dominance are we going to say no 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 we should leave it to the patent controller or to the civil court or say xyz regulator or whether the commission should examine these issues few area which i will just take half minutes to finish the few areas which i have tried to zero down in the preliminary stage what we are at the moment is we don't have a clarity though we have a clarity under the act but the parties they always try to litigate and they always try to say no 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 it's a basically the tough war between a ip regime and the competition regime and at the end of the day we have a judgment from delhi high court which has affirmed the jurisdiction of cci to examine these issues but again the point is something which started in 2013 you have a judgment in 2016 and the matter will go to the supreme court it it's going to take few years so at the end of the day if you are litigating for 5 years trying to find out which authority is going to have jurisdiction over these matters so when actually the authority is going to investigate and when we are going to have indeed a judgment on merit whether there is indeed an abuse of dominance or not so it's going to take long and long and long and we are not finding any end of it thank you thank you thank you very much uh, uh, avinash so the next presenter is uh, mr itubeleng uh, lesofe madam itubeleng mr itubeleng lesofe who is a senior uh, who is a uh, senior legal analyst from the competition commission from uh, south africa you have uh, 10 minutes thank you very much thank you very much um good morning ladies and gentlemen I'm very excited to be here. I must also confess that I'm I'm an outsider and it's my first time in India. So I feel like I'm a new entrant in the market and for my growth and, and expansion um I have no option but to collude with or to join or rather to join a, a cartel that exists. So I look forward to meeting each and every one of you. Um my my paper uh, focuses on challenges that arise um from a, a or as a result of the interplay between um competition policy and um intellectual property policy and i i have this discussion in within the context of what i term um forum shopping um and i use south africa as a case study um so as a starting point i will explain briefly what um forum shopping is So forum shopping has been described as an attempt um by a party to have um a case or rather its case considered in a forum where it has the greatest prospects of success in other words um the choice of forum um here by a litigant is informed um by the likely outcome in a particular forum and not necessarily by the suitability of um the 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 forum itself so even if or in cases where the, you know there is a specialized forum um with expertise and 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 experience uh, to hear the matter a litigant who in engages in forum shopping would rather opt for a, a, a an alternative forum provided that they 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 are higher prospects of success now if you look at um both case law and literature um there appears to be different views on whether or not forum shopping forum shopping is a good thing um for instance uh, one of the appeal courts in the united states has expressed a view that there is nothing wrong with forum shopping especially if there is legislation um that uh, uh, promotes that or, or that encourages that um whereas if you look at one of the decisions of the constitutional court in south africa this court has expressed some level of discomfort with um the practice of forum shopping um there are these different views because there are indeed uh, advantages and disadvantages of the practice so for instance if you look at the disadvantages of the practice um uh, it may uh, result in delay it may be used as 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 a delaying tactic um whereas um in some instances the chosen forum may not necessarily have the necessary expertise and skills to hear a particular case and also in some in some instances it may also lead to inefficiencies in 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 a sense that um the a, a, a significant number of cases may be may end up being uh, in the hands of one 
particular forum. In other words, there may be an over-concentration of cases uh, because of, of, of the, the perception that that particular forum is a uh, better place to, to, to consider the matter. On the flip side, there are advantages of, of the practice. Um, one of them is that it allows uh, lawyers um, to assist their clients to locate the most favorable forum based on jurisdictional rules. And under these circumstances, there shouldn't really be any issues with forum shopping. Forum shopping can also assist in terms of uh, reducing uh, litigation um, costs, especially if you know matters are heard by forums that are, are, are quite expeditious when, when, when dealing with, with the issues. Now, if I, I I, I zoom in and now look at experiences in, in, in South Africa. Um, I've observed that there has been an increase um, in the number of cases that are brought before competition agencies in, in South Africa, in particular the Competition Commission. Uh, and these cases are case, these are cases that arise from the exercise of intellectual property rights. So if you look at in the past just about nine months, um, the Competition Commission has had to deal with four different uh, cases that relate uh, 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 on, on, the, in, in, on the exercise of uh, RPRs. So one of the cases has been referred to the Competition Tribunal, and um, in June this year, uh, three uh, investigations were launched. And in all these investigations, the issues are really uh, largely around the exercise of RPRs. Um, and uh, 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 I mean, in one of the cases, there are clear allegations that there has been an abuse of, of, of intellectual property rights. Now, um, the question then is, that, I've, um, um, that I've asked is whether is it necessary for the Competition Commission to intervene in, in these cases, because these are cases that relate largely on the exercise of intellectual property rights. And it appears that in South Africa there are a number of factors that make uh, uh, the intervention of the Competition Commission necessary. Um, so, for instance, if you look at the, the patent environment, um, in South Africa, uh, uh, the patent environment is such that um, there is no uh, uh, what is commonly referred to as, as a, 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 a substantive evaluation process when a patent application is made. In other words, um, when a, 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 the patent office receives a patent application, the least that they do is to check if uh, minimum basic requirements are met. That is, forms, uh, uh, correct forms have been completed and the prescribed fee has been paid. Other than that, there is no detailed examination uh, of the application. There is also no uh, pre- and post-grant oppos opposition proceedings, whereby third parties would get the opportunity to challenge uh, uh, the, 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 the applications. And as a result of, 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 of these limitations, um, it appears that in South Africa, a significant number of patent applications are approved. Um, so they, they, even in non-deserving cases, patents are granted. Um, and, and I mean, uh, to give an example, just in, in, in 2012, 83% of patent applications were approved. Now, if you do a comparison uh, and you use uh, uh, other developing countries such as uh, uh, India and, and, and uh, uh, Brazil, you will realize that um, because in those jurisdictions, it, approvals were, were, were below 10%. So that clearly shows that there may be problems in South Africa. Other challenges are that um, there is legislation that allows for compulsory li uh, licensing. This legislation has been in existence for over 40 years. However, not a single uh, uh, license has been issued uh, uh, in terms of, of, of this, this act. Um, so because of these and other challenges, parties that have a, 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 a patent-related problems now tend to approach the competition authorities for assistance. Now, I then look at, in as much as it's necessary for competition agencies to intervene in these matters, um, what are measures that can be put in place to limit their involvement or rather to manage their, their involvement? Um, there appears to be a, a, a move a, a globally towards the creation or establishment of um, specialized adjudicative forums for, 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 uh, for, for, for IP matters. And I ask the question, is this perhaps the solution? I must point out that even in South Africa, uh, uh, there are plans in the pipeline to introduce what is called the um, Intellectual Property Tribunal, which will uh, uh, you know, operate as a specialized uh, uh, forum. 
um, uh, the chairperson made reference to, 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 to guidelines on the enforcement of competition law. Um, it appears that uh, in some jurisdictions, these uh, work well, but are they, are they effective enough? And is this something that a, a jurisdiction such as the Competition Commission of South Africa should consider? Because we don't have those in, 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 in South Africa. And also the issue of collaboration. I think collaboration between IP agencies and um, competition agencies is inevitable uh, if we, we, uh, we are to manage this, this, this potential or the existing tension. But then the question is, is there sufficient uh, uh, collaboration uh, between these agencies. If you look at South Africa, it appears that uh, there isn't. And this is evident from the fact that there is no MOU between the Competition Commission of South Africa and the IP uh, agencies. Uh, and the, you know, our authority is known for, com for concluding these kind of arrangements with, with, with uh, its counterparts. Um, and lastly, I pose the question whether perhaps um, given the, 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 the limitations that exist in legislation, is it, uh, is it perhaps necessary for, 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 SA, for the South African laws to be amended and would this assist in addressing some of these limitations? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Itumelek. So let's uh, move now to the, to the next part of our, our panel. Uh, so we have uh, four discussants. Two are going to discuss the uh, uh, Avanish Sharma document, and two of them, the Itamileg, uh, 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 Itamileg uh, uh, Lesofe paper. So, f from the first, uh, we will have uh, Derek uh, Reisman, Ritzman, who is, uh, who is going to, who is uh, senior vice president of, uh, of uh, Compass Lexicon. And then we will have uh, Sujita Subramanian, who is also senior, but she's a senior lecturer in the, in the University of Liverpool. As you can see, both are very young, but they are already very senior. So <laughs> we, we will start, uh, you will have 10 minutes each. Uh, so Derek, you have, you have the floor first. Unfortunately, Eduardo, I'm not quite as long, young as uh, people think. I'm probably almost as old as you, uh, however, uh, very sadly. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk today about uh, the, the, the Sharma paper, which is wonderful, and I, I thank Cuts very much for inviting uh, me to this very important occasion and the opportunity to discuss this uh, excellent paper. Uh, what, what I've also been asked to talk about a little bit is specifically the, the question of how these policies can be aligned, the uh, policy innovative approaches to, to consolidate and realign competition policy and IP protection policy, and what role agencies have played in this regard. And, and my, the, my background to that is probably relevant. I've just recently gone back into private practice with Compass Lexicon, uh, but beforehand, I spent uh, uh, over a decade in, in government with uh, at the European Commission and the Chief Economist team there and at the Australian Competition Commission and most recently as the Chief Economist of the Hong Kong Competition Commission. So to give particularly an agency perspective and a, a sense of what agencies are doing and can do uh, with the idea, uh, the proposition that this can help going forward. Um, so I think it's it's worth starting to just to to remind ourselves just how our understanding of the way that competition and innovation relate has itself grown. At the frontier, we used to think variously that either competition was good for innovation or competition was bad for innovation. What some people call the Schumpeter approach, from the uh, that some uh, that uh, uh, market power is good for innovation because it creates monopoly rents, which thereby incentivizes people to innovate and also provides the funds for innovation, versus what's called the Arrow approach after the Nobel Prize winner, Ken Arrow, that the process of rivalry spurs me to innovate to keep ahead of you, me, Apple, or Google, or whatever, to, to keep ahead of the rival, so that competition being good for innovation. And more recently, we've, we've understood that it's a little bit of both and that it's actually a very complex relationship. If we look at the, 
Uh, the economic, theoretical, and empirical literature, people talk about an inverted U-shape, but the basic proposition is that both forces play a role. And so it's a very complex relationship, and it's a very complex relationship about what will happen in the future. A and that's the difficulty, and that's one of the reasons why agencies have, pr have probably shied away from dealing with this kind of thing in the past. But the good news, and my prescription, is that agencies are getting better at doing this and need to continue to get better at doing this. And I'm going to provide just a, a general comment on what agencies can and are doing and should be doing and give a couple of examples, if I have enough time, from the European Commission about what I think is a very innovative approach to understanding how competition and innovation can both be accommodated. So w one, of the, one of the ways in which agencies have got much better is by understanding error cost analysis. So we all know that agencies can make mistakes in two directions, and this is particularly important with regard to the impact on innovation. So agencies can under-enforce. And the cost to society is obvious. There's an anti-competitive practice going on. It's allowed to continue. There is a cost to society. And we can see that cost in a lot of cases. Um, or they can over-enforce. And this is where it gets much more tricky and where agencies are, have in the past may, may, maybe not seen this or been willing to see this sufficiently, but where they're getting much, much better. And the cost of over-enforcement is that good behavior, pro-competitive behavior, and specifically here, innovative behavior, just doesn't take place. Now, so we have both the deterrent effect of enforcement, but also the chilling effect of enforcement. And one of the difficulties, which is a difficulty for researchers and for agencies, is that the cost of things which don't happen is really hard to see and to evaluate, because there are things which could have happened in a different world, but didn't happen. But the cost to society is just the same, even if we can't see it. Now, and that's particularly the case in innovation. Innovation is a, inherently a risky, forward-looking activity. And if you change the risk or reward balance, you, you change behavior. That's simple economics. The question, how do you change behavior, and does it matter or not? is a complex question, and Thomas very rightly pointed out to complexities in the literature that in some jurisdictions it can have more of a chilling effect than in others, but just the proposition that it does affect behavior, I think most of us would agree about. If I was giving a longer lecture on this, uh, I, I would put up a slide which has a, a graph of a distribution be, uh, of possible outcomes and showing how the distribution changes or shifts if you uh, intervene in a market to cut off, to regulate prices or to change the possibility of different outcomes and make the point that you, you, you change the incentive to innovate and thereby you, you reduce potentially innovation. But I think we all get the, the basic proposition. And so that's just background, but agencies have become much better at understanding that. They need to keep understanding that. And that's particularly the case in innovation. And so I think, arguably, the most important change which I've certainly observed and which I think we can observe in agency documents and decisions is a change in agency disposition and in lawmakers' disposition. Uh, uh, all competition enforcement requires judgment. Uh, we, we are talking, in most cases, about the effect of behavior on a market and, in many cases, the likely future effect of behavior on a market. I'm um, going way too long. Um, and the idea of legal certainty is wonderful, but that's difficult to do in a situation where judgment of the effect is a part of the law. And agencies have become much better, uh, uh, including the public statement by the current EU commissioner that to encourage innovation, you need both competition and reward for innovators. 20 years ago, that may not have been understood as much. Today, it is getting better understood, and that will continue to grow. So the attitude is improving. And uh, that is despite the fact that short-term static effects, as Ms. Guri pointed out uh, uh, before, we need to look at a more dynamic uh, effect. Short-term static effects are easy to understand. Long-term dynamic effects are difficult to understand. 
but agencies have to get better and are getting much better trying to grasp that much more conceptual difficulty. So just in the maybe one or two minutes that I've got left, I do want to mention uh, the DG competition. There are several different instruments which I think are really good to have a look at. Uh, the EU's horizontal guidelines, which incorporate a chapter on the standardization process, I think are my favorite example. But the uh, technology transfer agreements block exemption is also a wonderful document. Uh, uh, we can quibble about aspects of it, but the core proposition that we have to marry and, and find ways to allow innovation and maintain the incentives for innovation while understanding that restricted, more restricted category of behavior which might chill competition more than uh, it benefits innovation I is controlled. Trying to marry those two. And um, especially the, uh, uh, the, 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 the reference to patent pools in the technology transfer agreements. But I'll take just one half a minute to talk about the, um, the horizontal guidelines. The horizontal guidelines has a chapter, basically, a section on standardization agreements. Now, we know that at first blush, a standardization agreement would tick all of the boxes, probably, of a hardcore horizontal restriction because it's an agreement among competitors about things which are fundamental to market outcomes, including, in many cases, the, either the prices or the mechanism for setting prices of important inputs and outputs of the standardized process. So it screams cartel, but it very, very obviously is not a cartel because it's not designed to just jack up prices and fleece consumers. It's about creating something which benefits everybody. And the horizontal guidelines recognize that basic fact, which they may, might not, not have done 30, 40 years ago, but they recognize it and they provide clear guidance about when there will be safe harbors. There will be safe harbors as long as a handful of things don't take place. Or there are a number of handful, a handful of quite open conditions. Um, that there be unrestricted participation. So a standardization is a good thing as long as you don't use it as a vehicle to exclude your rivals. If nobody's excluded, then that's an important condition. Uh, and as long as the procedure for adopting the standard is, is transparent, so people don't play sort of activist kind of games, uh, I'm getting my cases wrong, but don't disclose patents after the standard's been adopted. Uh, and a FRAND commitment. Now, FRAND and standard essential patents, there have been hundreds of conferences, including, I believe, by CUTS and other organizations in India, including one that I've spoken at, is a whole other chapter. But uh, th as th the basic proposition is that as long as a handful of conditions are met, so long, as long as a, uh, this is not used as a vehicle to choke off competition, we will accept the benefits. Uh, and I think that's a great example of marrying those two policies in a really important area. And with that, I've been red flagged a couple of times. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Derek. So, Sujita, uh, you, you have the floor now for 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really, really pleased to be here. Um, I think it's an excellent example of how um, trying to work out a theme of a conference can uh, decide um, the, the, the quality of the conference because practically every single speech uh, that has been given on this floor has definitely sparked a, a thought or two. So it's, it's absolutely well-planned um, uh, theme, well-planned conference. And thank you to the organizers for the invitation. I really am happy to be here. Um, so I have read with, um, with great interest the paper by Avinash. Um, it's... Uh, the way I would like to structure this, we've got 10 minutes, and um, I'd like to speak about the paper itself because that's basically the role of the discussant, I guess. I mean, so I want to point things out there, but then on the other hand, uh, I've also um, looked with interest some of the material on uh, lesser face papers, so I think there are things to marry there. Um, and uh, finally, some thoughts on, of my own, um, if we have the time. Um, so, um, in terms of the paper, um, 
I find that uh, Avinash has made a very good consolidation of what the uh, principles are in terms of IP law as well as competition law and the interaction between these two areas of law um, in uh, the Indian context. Um, um, to the, in the interesting aspect of it actually comes towards the very end where he talks about potential conflicting uh, relationships between these two um, areas of law as well as um, what are the challenges um, uh, that uh, lie uh, uh, within the Indian uh, framework. Um, The problem I found um, uh, here was that, uh, yes, uh, there was a, a very good illustration of what the uh, conflicts are and what the challenges are, uh, but then ideally what I would have liked to see is actually, you know, in terms of how to proceed uh, from, from that point in view. And I, and I think that's where the paper somehow stops. I mean, just gives me all the interest and then just, you know, uh, uh, stops at some point um, where it should have actually gone on. Um, uh, interestingly, um, some thing which has been repeatedly coming out in this conference is that, um, you know, we need to stop looking at the examples of Europe, the examples of US, because the situation in, in India is very different, develop, in developing countries is very different. And I suppose when we say developing countries, of course, we need to make that big distinction between the LDCs and other developing countries, what the OECD calls the advanced economies, because obviously the situation is uh, uh, exceptionally different uh, in those situations. So I'm, I'm trying to go and stick to the issues of advanced economies as opposed to the LDCs, uh, mainly because the situations of LDCs is acceptable to, I mean, the, um, how to deal with it is acceptable to both the developed as well as developing countries, and therefore there's not much of an argument there. So tr transition period has been given and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to look into that. That's a different argument altogether. Uh, how do we deal with it in India or other advanced economies, uh, China and so on and so forth, and um, uh, whether or not we should actually take this example. Uh, again, I find it somewhat, um, I don't know if the right word is simplistic, uh, to say that the whole problem will be solved if we simply start coordinating between the IP and competition uh, law. Uh, to what end? What exactly are we trying to seek with this coordination? It's, it's, uh, that's a different debate, and I would like to um, speak on that a little further. Uh, but again, uh, 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 another point, which is a theme which is also coming out in the conferences, is, is that uh, perhaps uh, one must supersede the other. Uh, and we had the very excellent presentation uh, from uh, Desai yesterday, uh, wherein he actually, uh, you know, um, I think uh, stirred a lot of uh, uh, passions when he said that um, uh, IP ought to be abolished, um, and, and then uh, warmed the cockles of all the competition lawyers and economists here by saying, oh, well, you know, the whole thing can be done by, <laughs> by uh, allowing uh, competition a law to supersede over uh, intellectual property rights. Um, I'm not convinced um, that competition law is the complete solution either because, for instance, we do see that many of the markets um, that develop, for instance, in uh, the rail and the post and uh, so on and so forth are national monopolies. I mean, uh, it would not have, uh, of course, uh, worked out if it was not for the fact that there was a lack of competition. Um, so to, uh, to somehow state that competition is the be-all and end-all of it is, is not something which, which I'm happy I'm happy to subscribe to either. And also the fact that uh, something which was also raised, uh, the, the way in which uh, many of these issues can be dealt with is also by patent pooling and so on and so forth. We do need not just patent pooling, R&D pooling as such, uh, technology transfer agreements as we can see and so on and so forth. So it's quite, it's necessary sometimes to avoid these sort of wasteful expenditures and uh, um, create some sort of economies of scope and scale. And there may be uh, issues wherein, you know, uh, competition should accommodate that as well, competition policies. Uh, so uh, I, I, I think, um, uh, and, and then, of course, the, the uh, argument that was raised uh, earlier on, uh, stating that, yes, the problems of competi intellectual property law must be dealt with by intellectual property law. It's not uh, the norm-making body, the competition uh, lawyers, who should deal with uh, the issues or problems arising from the uh, patent law. Uh, this is a view that I, I had myself subscribed to and I had myself written about in, in my Microsoft paper. Um, but uh, since writing it, I think I have... Um, slowly mood position and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to argue otherwise now uh, that I do think of course com competition uh, law has a role to play and why do I say that and I say that because uh, for instance if you look at the case of India and, and although we agree in, and if you see Avinash's paper uh, he makes this point that India has a very different um, uh, you know uh, ground rules and f frameworks and uh, situations and so on and so forth yes I 
completely agree uh, with all of that. Uh, however, if you look at the, the, the case law over the last decade in the European Union, we actually see that those case laws can potentially be used very, very useful for the Indian situation. We can actually use that. So for instance, yes, we have the guidelines for uh, how to deal with exclusionary abuses and so on and so forth, but we don't, don't have for exploitative abuses. But the latest case that we see in the Aspen Pharma case, where they talked about uh, excessive pricing and how excessive price is an abuse of, uh, uh, can be an abuse of uh, the dominant position. If you look at things like that, I mean, potentially the use of those sort of legislation in uh, India can be extremely useful. Um, so uh, quite uh, clearly because uh, it's very, very difficult for us to use the flexibilities of TRIPS. Uh, we still talk about TRIPS and yes, it has flexibilities and yes, it could be used and yes, IP can uh, deal with it. But actually the things have moved on. I mean, we are not standing at TRIPS anymore. We are, not stand we are now looking towards TRIP Plus and also outside of the WTO forum. So for instance, if you're looking at, uh, uh, I mean, when the developed countries saw that they could not exercise whatever they wanted to exercise, in the WIPO forum, of course, then they shifted the forum, the regime shifting, as, we, as Helfer uh, speaks about it, uh, and moved on to WTO. And now that they can see that, you know, they can't bring into the WTO agenda, you know, the things that they would like to, uh, developing countries would like to bring, they have, of course, moved on to ACTA, and from ACTA, they've moved on to TTIP, and from TTIP, they're moving on to, uh, you know, various other uh, FTAs agreements and so on and so forth. So the forums have completely changed. And so to, to speak about, yes, IP can be dealt with uh, within the TRIPS framework, within uh, you know, flexibilities and so on and so forth, perhaps, uh, may not necessarily be uh, the right direction for us to take. So, um, because I've been red flagged, I think I think I'll stop uh, by stating that I think um, uh, perhaps the paper could consider. I mean, and that's one thing the paper didn't do as well. I mean, it did talk about uh, Europe having many of the abuse of dominant cases, but actually didn't. Um, put in any of the case law uh, uh, there at all. Did, did deal with US, but not with EU. I think perhaps uh, an explore, exploring the, the European cases and trying to see actually how that can potentially be used in the Indian context may perhaps be a way forward. So I think I'll stop there because the disciplinary lady has. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sujita. Uh, we, will, we will go to the next uh, 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 discussants, the next group of discussants. They are going to discuss the document by, by Mr. Itumeleng from South Africa. But I, I would like to, to, to take this, this, this moment before I give you the floor, just to uh, suggest a group of uh, other players in this game that have not been mentioned uh, very much, they were mentioned in the, in the former panel, which is the judiciary. And I'm taking this opportunity because precisely the, in the case of South Africa, we have a, a, a first-class judiciary uh, a group, which is the tribunal the, uh, of, of South Africa, the competition tribunal, who, who is a, a first-class group, a, a very specialized group of, uh, of uh, judges there. A, and I think this is, it, it is very important to see what's, what, what is the role of the judiciary in this uh, set of uh, decisions that are taken by, by intellectual property uh, agencies, competition agencies, and sectorial regulators. So give me, uh, now uh, give the, uh, I will give the floor to, uh, to Mr. Ayman Shafei, who is, who is an independent consultant in Egypt. You have the floor. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I really enjoyed the, the, the paper from uh, Mr. Lesofu. Uh, um, uh, when I was working at the Competition Authority in Egypt, uh, always our reference was uh, uh, the South African Competition Authority and case laws because we have sharing like uh, common uh, problems and, and, and challenges uh, in the economy. Um, I, I shall first recall a quotation of Dr. Heinz He's a professor of economics at the University of uh, uh, Graz in Austria. He, uh, he said that while in the past the battle of competition is mainly fought with respect to prices, in the recent case it is fought with respect to the new technical knowledge, the improvements and the innovation and research and development. Uh, well, uh, first, I, uh, commenting on, on the paper, uh, uh, Mr. Lesufu mentioned that uh, one of the provision uh, that find the way to to uh, to, uh, to answer to, to to deal with the competition and IP with the essential facility provisions. Uh, 
uh, well, this is a concrete uh, um, solution to uh, to find to to, to to deal with the competition LPIs. But if uh, by implementing this this uh, idea uh, in in countries like North Africa and Gulf, and Gulf countries, if you talking about essential facilities, the first answer would be uh, special ports. Uh, pipeline, uh, uh, pipeline, gas pipelines, uh, uh, roads. But if uh, um, to introduce a notion of essential uh, IP rights in essential facilities, I believe it would be uh, facing uh, major legal challenges and changing uh, essential uh, knowledge to the judge and to the um, uh, to, 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 to the decision making in Egypt and in, in North Africa. So my, my, my first question, uh, what are the legal challenges you are facing when you are implementing the provision of essential facilities in the framework of IP and competition? Uh, this is uh, one, one thing I need to, to hear from you. Uh, well, uh, the, the second thing that uh, came in my mind uh, regarding the implementation of the IP and competition uh, uh, when I was I was working at the Egyptian Competition Authority, uh, our major challenge in, in this uh, sector that they were facing a real uh, problem uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the IP rights protection itself. So we faced many uh, cases where we have in, uh, on the same table uh, the, the, uh, uh, someone who is complaining against an IP license or uh, refusal to, to license, and he's the same person who is not respecting the IP protection of his, uh, of his competitor. So, um, and, we, and this, we, we're facing this in the, the cinema production and the, in, the, in the drug sector, in the medicine sector, we're facing the same problem in the, uh, we, have, uh, we have a dominant firm in the cable, um, uh, uh, network cable uh, production, uh, if, if we talk with, 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 with them, he said, okay, we have like f more than 50% of market share. He said, okay, which market are we talking about? Okay, it's the official market share, um, more than 50%. But if you are uh, accounting the counterfeit products because of uh, very low, uh, a very weak uh, IP protection enforcement, um, less than 25% threshold of the law. And this is, uh, and this argument was not empirically proved, but but uh, uh, it sounds logic when you talk to the decision making. We, it sounds logic because you know the uh, the law enforcement in um, in uh, in North Africa, in, in Gulf countries, in, in African countries that we have are facing real challenging in protection of IP rights. So, how uh, are you weighing between uh, a weak protection of I, of IP rights? And then enforcing, enforcing the, 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 the uh, enforcing against uh, an alleged dominance or refusal, refusal to license. Um, I, I, I may recall in uh, in Saudi Arabia, they are facing right now uh, in the in the uh, in the public bid refusal to license in the ICT sector. Well, and there are major there are major major, major uh, 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 enterprises like. Uh, the multinationals are working in, in Europe or United States, and they have uh, uh, quite a good uh, compliance program. But when when when, the, when we're facing this in, in Saudi Arabia, for for instance, they said, "Okay, I'm not protected uh, by an by an IP law. So uh, why are you talking to me when when it comes to refusal to license? I'm losing uh, market shares. I'm losing uh, business." In the uh, 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 in the market, so and 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 if you uh, enforce me to license in, in the bid after I'm losing a, bid, a, a, a public bid, this is you are making worse for me, and this is the way I'm uh, counter. Uh, this is the way I, I this is and, and this is the way to to uh, to meet uh, my losses because of uh, uh, a very weak enforcement of the IP protection right. Uh, this is in, in, in this kind of examples we can see it in Egypt, in uh, in, in Gulf countries, uh, and I believe you you might be sharing the same issue in South Africa. Uh, be, before the implementation of uh, competition IP, you should be protecting the IP itself, and then looking one step forward. Uh, this is um, um, this is another sort of uh, uh, regarding the, the paper, and if you come. 
to forum shopping, it, it might be it might be uh, uh, a legitimate way to uh, to offset the the weak enforcement of, of, of the IP protection. So if now talking that uh, on 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 a policy basis, so the IP and competition and IP protection it should be one set. So you cannot split if you don't have an, uh, a good IP protection. So you, you cannot enforce competition. But uh, uh, the, 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 this, this, this economic tools should be complementing each others, not leaving the, the first step very weak without any enforcement. And because of social economic uh, situations that bringing prices uh, low, uh, low, and then you are enforcing uh, if you should to license uh, against someone who is, he, he might be abusing, yes, but he, there is one step back. Uh, why he's abusing the using his abuse of dominance position? Um, yes, I I I am uh, regarding the, uh, medi the 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 medications. Um, for instance, uh, the WHO um, had a, a statistics in 2003 saying that uh, the the sales of uh, counterfeit uh, medications reached more than 30 billion US dollars in, in 2003. And um, my, my, my question, because we are facing this situation in India, Egypt, South Africa, same, same thoughts, that uh, if using to license in the medication sector, uh, they, are, they, are, they are the same, they are same uh, logic that we are, uh, you, you are uh, just offsetting some of our losses due to, uh, to uh, feeble enforcement, to, to weak enforcement of the, the IP and the protection. Uh, because, uh, that's why we can, we can find that some type of agreements, uh, like uh, refusal to license, uh, like exclusive uh, distribution to, uh, to, to, uh, with certain conditions in order to offset these losses in the sector. And then, so how are you, are you weighing between these two uh, contradicting uh, uh, position between uh, the loss in 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 the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the business and uh, obliging them to to license uh, or to to provide uh, uh, an IP license to, to a competitor that might be the infringer of the IP himself. Okay, I'm sticking to the red flag. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much, Ayman. Uh, last but never least, we have uh, uh, Kiran Mitterhan, who is a former di executive director of the Mauritius uh, Competition Authority. Uh, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you. Well, let me start by joining all the panelists to thank Katz for the invitation, and especially Mr. Pradeep Mehta. India is like second home to me, so it's always a pleasure to be here. Okay, coming to the paper of Mr. Utumeling, the main uh, points he has made is about the insufficiency of IP legislation in South Africa, which is one of the main reasons for forum shopping. So since there are these difficulties, since there are these weaknesses which exist in the South African IP law, the tendency would be to go for a forum where you can get result remedies which is in your favor. The paper mentioned that the IP law does not follow international norms. It is criticized for not permitting pre and post grant patent opposition. Then there is issues with compulsory licensing. The provision of compulsory licensing, you mentioned it is uh, inadequate so, because uh, it is subject to a judicial process which is not the international law, so which result in cost and delays. And you made several um, uh, other points, especially about um, the patent act requiring the government to first negotiate with holders of IP rights to license the patent on public interest grant. From there, I'm going to take it and talk about whether the weakness in IP legislation would necessarily result or not in forum shopping, and I'm going to talk about the case of Mauritius uh, before going on uh, with what the challenges we faced and uh, what I think is 
a probable solution, but which we haven't implemented as well. Mauritius has a very good IP uh, legislation. It's based on international best practices, on international treaties. We have tried to incorporate you know, the best thing because um, uh, we do value a lot about uh, developing our economies. In fact, we are one of the most successful financial center in the region, highest FDI investor in India. So we place lots of emphasis to make sure that our laws really comply with our international obligation, with international treaties to which we have signed. So we've got a very good IP law. What is relevant there in the IP provision in relation to competition is um, one of the section, which is section 23 uh, of the Patent Act, which speak of anti-competitive behavior. In fact, what this section says that the competent authority and I'll talk about the competent authority later on. The competent authority, of course, in terms of IP competent authority, can grant compulsory license upon the application of any party when it determines that the manner of exploitation by the owner of the patent or his license is anti-competitive and it is necessary to remedy such anti-competitive practice. Great, our IP law already makes provision for granting a compulsory license when there is anti-competitive behavior. It goes on to say, but this is subject to the appropriate compensation. Because if you've allowed um, uh, an IP holder the, the grant of exclusive like monopoly rights, we will say, so there must be some way to compensate so that you can strike this balance between having the monopoly position and losing it. So there is the element of adequate compensation which comes in. And it also goes on to say that the competent authority shall take into account the economic value of the authorization as determined in the state decision and where the decision has been taken under the relevant section 1B, the need to correct these anti-competitive practices. Now, how, how does the competition authority come into play with this. We're going to say, great, we have provisions under the IP Act to deal with anti-competitive behavior. And on top of that, we have the, the Mauritian legislation, the competi le competition legislation, sorry, which has in its schedule uh, excluded any agreement insofar as it contains provision relating to the use, license, and assignment of rights under or existing by virtue of laws relating to copyright, industrial design, patent, trademarks, or service name. They are all excluded from the application of the Competition Act. Is this the solution? Maybe you will say yes, so it's okay. No problem, no forum shopping, no overlapping, this is it. But then matters get complicated because CCM came with a guideline. The guidelines say, yes, there is this exclusion, but we'll still look into it. So we're going to look into it, uh, not if you are charging an excessive pricing, not if you are involved in an exclusionary conduct, but hey, section 41, our cartel provision will apply. So if there is an agreement of cooperation, we will see whether there is not a risk of price being fixed. If we see there is this risk, we're going to intervene and uh, we're going to take measures. Similarly, our merger provision is going to be applicable if one IP right holder acquires another uh, IP rights. So we're going to consider it as a merger. Our monopoly provision will also apply in case of tying and bundling. So we will still be there. But this reg uh, these guidelines have not been tested. I have been with the regulator, but I'm pretty sure if this goes to court, that court will say, come on. There is an exclusion there. What is your guideline talking about? Your guideline cannot overrule the main provisions of the Act. So what is the solution? Do we go to the IP office? So we've been receiving complaints at the Competition Commission, and we've told them there is this anti-competitive provision uh, within the IP law, so this is where you should knock the door. And the answer was, nobody understands IP at the IP office. Why? Because it is all the civil servant who's been appointed there, there is no support staff, no expertise in IP, uh, no expertise in anti-competitive behavior. So you are back to zero. 
competition law doesn't want to intervene in case the court rules that you know this is a blocks ex exclusion. You can't import the other provisions of the Competition Act just to uh, enable somebody to have uh, a solution that they are not having. So there are changes which which are in the pipeline. But to come to your paper, I want to say that you might be having the best of legislation, but that's not necessarily the solution because in terms of institutional capacity, organizational capacity, you, may not, you, you might be even weaker there with the best of legislation. What we have done in other cases, I've been flagged, so I'm not going to be long. We have done where there has been this case of firm shopping, especially where you have different sector regulators. We've been having it in the telecommunication sector, in the financial services sector, um, uh, in the utility sector. We proceeded by having memorandum of understanding with the different regulators, where the role of each institution is defined, and when there is overlapping, how do we deal with it? For example, in cases of uh, financial services, for example, or even utility, we have provided for cases where those, like in the, in the IP case, it would be that, that the IP office would refer the matter to the competition commission, and then, um, or we might be having a joint investigation where the competition expertise will be borrowed from the commission so that they can come up uh, with a solution. So ideally, the IP office would follow the guideline, what is anti-competitive behavior, and import it to their legislation to be able to find a solution. I've been flagged three times, I think. So probably um, during question and answer time, I can elaborate more on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kiran. So we, we have a few minutes for, for questions uh, that you may have to the panelists and, and, and the presenters. Uh, please, you have to present yourself first and then uh, if you could be brief and direct your question to the person that you would like to, to okay. put it forward, please. Okay. Uh, um, basically, I was a case handler in the Tunisian Competition Council. And now I'm moving to the tribunal court as a magistrate. Um, just um, I would like uh, to um, interact with uh, Mr. Shefai um, concerning how to deal with IPs cases uh, by the Tunisian Competition Council. Um, we have a lot of problems in in dealing with such cases, um, and actually we avoid. Uh, to discuss matters related to IP. So we focus on uh, the anti-competitive practice because these matters uh, belong to the civil judge. But uh, I didn't hear anyone uh, talking about the preventive role of uh, competition authorities. Um, for example, in Tunisia, the draft of legislative and uh, regulatory texts dealing uh, with trade or any field uh, which will establish uh, conditions or barriers to the market, um, the, uh, the council is uh, compulsory. Uh, he have to give, uh, uh, he, um, uh, excuse me, uh, is compulsory consulted. And uh, with, uh, with the ALECA, which is the, the deep and comprehensive uh, agreement which will be signed with UE, we have a set of texts which are going to be revised and especially um, texts related to IPs. And here, uh, through, the, through its uh, uh, consultative role, the competition uh, authority, the Tunisian competition authority, uh, would uh, would play a significant role uh, to make this balance between IPRs and competition law. Uh, the second point, uh, which uh, which is related to the uh, preventive role, too, we have the economic concentrations and uh, agreements which are exemptions from antitrust uh, uh, behavior. Uh, and, the, and here, the procedure is, is very uh, complex. Uh, the, minister, the Minister of Trade, uh, before giving 
uh, his agreement have to consult the Tunisian Competition Council and here we, we a lot of conditions are enacted in law. This complexity uh, reduces the, 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 the complexity of the relation between IPRs and competition law. And I'm discovering uh, that, uh, that the system is not too bad in Tunisia and that we are dealing with, with these issues uh, daily, actually, uh, especially uh, with the franchise contracts, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Do, do we have another, another question? Yes, please. Hi, this is Parveer from Cuts International. I have a question for Derek. Um, you mentioned about horizontal guidelines and collaborative, how collaborative standardization has worked well for the consumers, but with, uh, 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 with confusions regarding what is FRAN, we're actually looking at how uh, we're regulating FRAN and what FRAN should be. So are we disincentivizing innovators to take part in the collaborative standardization process? And are we, on the other hand, also uh, incentivizing them to set up proprietary models of standardization? So that's the question. Yeah. So let's, hear, let's see if we have another question. So we have we will the questions and then we will ask. Please. Name is Rajan Matthews from CUI. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about this with regard to consumer rights. Could you please clarify whose rights, what rights, what uh, boundaries constitute the boundary conditions for these exercise of these rights? And uh, where does this all come from? I mean, it's a, just a general assumption in terms of this nebulous idea of rights. So how does national boundaries, constitutional uh, protections and all of this play into this definition of what is a right of this quote unquote consumer? Okay. Uh, so the question on what is FRAND, uh, I think we could spend the next three days here and still be no closer to the question. It's an exceptionally uh, 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 important question. It depends on the facts, um, uh, but it, I, all I can, without, uh, without knowing facts of a particular case or and what you know, so, uh, what, what, the, what the actual, uh, what the concept should mean in a particular case in a particular jurisprudence, of course, it's impossible to say what is FRAND, but. Uh, it, it's a wonderful example of a place where we want to capture all of the benefits of innovation and also the, the, that collaborative uh, sharing of knowledge which has network, massive network benefits because it allows disparate things to come together and create something new for where everybody benefits by everybody else putting in the classic network effect in a slightly unorthodox situation but the, the classic uh, benefit. And the fact that we recognize that it's good to share, for rivals to share, and even to set prices is, is exactly the motivation uh, uh, why we like standardization, even though it ticks all the boxes of a cartel, because it's not a cartel. It's about creating something new. Uh, but that, of course, then gives people property rights, intellectual property rights, which once something is effectively essential to a standard, gives people the, the opportunity to, uh, uh, to engage in hold-up and, and to basically engage in what some people might call ransom, uh, which, means, which means it's, as with every essential facility, it gives rise to the idea that uh, some sort of uh, economically efficient price rather than the monopoly price is the right thing. Otherwise, you lose the benefits of that innovation. But how do you set it? Uh, it depends on the facts, and you should have many more conferences, and I'd be glad to come, but it's a huge topic. On consumer rights, I, I wouldn't use that. I would use consumer, I personally don't speak about consumer rights, for consumer protection people will, but I will talk about uh, consumer welfare. That's the economist term, and that's our measure of trying to understand to what differing degrees to consumers benefit consumers as a whole, benefit from, say, a competitive market versus a monopoly, or a market with high innovation versus a market with low innovation. We wouldn't talk about, I happen to be a lawyer as well, but I'd have to put my lawyer's hat on to, uh, 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 to talk about rights. As an economist, I will talk about consumer welfare and, and similar ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Derek. So we will 
Do we have another another question? We have still time for one or two questions more. It's okay. So we we don't have any more questions. Uh, I don't know if at this moment uh, the the uh, presenters of the documents uh, would like to to express some some reflections and some some reactions. Uh, you have all the two minutes each. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for the comments. I think they are very uh, helpful. Um, just maybe to start by responding to one of the questions asked by Ayman regarding um, the essential facility uh, section in the Competition Act. Um, unfortunately, we haven't had a, a case um, where this section is, 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 is tested. And I, I think I get your point that given that you know, the section deals specifically about an essential facility and um, ordinarily an essential facility would be classified as a network or infrastructure. Um, there has been a, a number of, of papers written uh, which suggest that um, the meaning can actually, the meaning of that phrase can, can extend to IPRs as well. However, we haven't really had a test case and it would be interesting to, uh, to see a case of, of, of that nature. Um, Karen's comments were quite very helpful and useful as well. Um, I think uh, the use of MOUs is quite critical, and I agree with you that perhaps joint investigations um, could assist, especially because um, the nature of, of uh, skills that are required um, to look at uh, you know, cases that you know, touch both on competition and IP law. Um, so uh, joint investigations could probably uh, assist um, and I think your, uh, the Mauritius uh, Authority has been quite creative in terms of how it uses the, the guidelines, but I agree that uh, that may uh, result in potential legal challenges. But overall, thank you very much for the input. Thank you. Abhinesh? Yeah. Responding to the issue, I think it depends on different jurisdiction. If from pure economist perspective, I agree it's a consumer welfare total welfare, producer welfare. But if we look at from legal perspective, we have to look into what rights we are talking about. Rights may be constitutional rights, rights may be under a different statute, and whether it's a, to what extent we can get it enforced. For example, you may have several rights under different statute, but to what extent you are getting it enforced in case there is an infringement of that rights. So it matters. For example, you may be a consumer under the Consumer Protection Act, but you may not be a consumer elsewhere. For example, the definition, if you look at from competition legislation, the definition of a consumer is altogether different as compared to the definition of consumer when we look at under the Consumer Protection Act. Under the consumer laws, we are always looking at the end consumer, but that may not be the case in a competition regime. That may be altogether different things. 